Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Cindy Valladares. Thank you very much for being with us today as we present PCI DSS 3.0, Don't Shortchange Your PCI Readiness. This is a part one of a webcast series that Tripwire brings to you. And we have um, a very good uh, attendee list today, and we're very excited to be here today and share with you the, the slides. Um, before I get started, and I will, I'm, I'm sure I'll get this question along the way, but you will get a copy of the slides, and uh, we'll attempt to answer as many questions as you have during the session as well. Let me do a brief introduction of, um, of our speakers today. With us today, we have Jeff Hall. He's a security consultant at Fishnet Security. And he also writes the blog PCI Guru. Jeff um, is a senior consultant and has been focusing not only on security and compliance, and particularly PCI DSS for over 30 years. And it's a distinct pleasure to have you with us here today, Jeff. Uh, please say hello to the audience. Thank you, and welcome, everyone. And uh, my name, as I've mentioned before, is Cindy Valladares, and I work here at Tripwire, and I'm an author at the State of Security blog. Um, today, we're going to share with you some interesting facts and key takeaways about PCI DSS, and would invite all of you to either submit your questions in the question tab, as well as if you would like the to join the conversation on Twitter to join us at the hashtag PCI webcast. And you see um, Jeff and myself's Twitter uh, handle on, um, on the screen here, Cindy V and JB Hall 56. Okay. So the agenda for today's webcast, we're going to talk about the PCI DSS overview, what's coming, also talk about eight considerations for PCI 3.0 readiness and preparedness. Uh, why not 10? Why not 5? Uh, Jeff, um, Jeff did the bulk of the work on this content, and we really thought that 8 would come as uh, that there are 8 that you need to focus your attention on right now. Then we're going to talk about Q&A um, as well, as we discussed, and um, get, leave you with some PCI resources that are out there. Okay. So if we talk about um, PCI, um, the standard has been around for quite a number of years, but um, this past fall, the council released a new version that will come into effect here pretty shortly. And there's, there are three main key takeaways that you should consider when you are implementing the 3.0 version of the standard. Um, Jeff, if you could uh, explain to us um, those three main highlights. You know, the first one is there has been quite a number of renumbering of the requirements and test and rearranging of the requirement. Why did that happen? And, um, you know, are all of those changes impactful or just um, a matter of organizational preparedness? Well, there were, there were a number of things that happened. Obviously, there were some new requirements that, that got inserted. Um, mostly, though, the, the reordering and renumbering occurred so that QSAs can get um, get some um, oh what's the word I'm I'm searching for here? They wanted to be able to automate the process so that QSAs wouldn't spend so much time uh, writing the rock anymore, and so that reorganization caused some additional tests to be created and some other things. So there are a lot of new numbers, and so those of us that memorized it are going to have to memorize it again. Okay, the second um, key takeaway that the, the new version aims to have more flexibility and consistency across that entire framework. And I've heard that some of that was caused because of the inconsistencies that QSAs 
have um, had in the past, depending on the firm that you go to, you may get a different um, report of, on compliance and results on that. So, Jeff, given that you, you know, recovering QSA, I should say, <laughs> like many of my friends, what is your take on that? Um, why, you know, the, why is this a, a key takeaway? Well, actually, it's it's a discussion that's going on in the community that that got started with a comment that Brandon Williams made a number of weeks ago in which he kind of alluded to it but didn't really specify that there were more occurrences of periodic, periodically, and should in the new version. And if you go out and look at it, um, periodic and periodically – occur now 17 times, which is a 113% increase over version 2. And the word should occurs 82 more times than it used to, which is a 382% increase. So the community, the QSA community, is actually questioning whether or not we're going to get consistency because of the increase in those, in those three words. Yeah, that's an inter interesting conversation. And um, if you're not familiar with Brandon Williams, uh, he and Anton Chuvakin, now with Gartner, produced a book around, around PCI DSS. I think it's on the second edition now. Uh, but both of, uh, of those gentlemen are, are really well versed in the standard. Um, check them out if, if you would like to get more details on the standard. Okay, so the third key takeaway is the integration of PCI into day-to-day -day business operations. And this is one that, you know, as I saw it at first glance, I was, yes, you know, finally they're, they're trying, starting to get it and move that into um, more business as usual and, you know, compliance, uh, you know, being more towards security. Now, uh, I know you were at the at the council meeting, Jeff, and you have a particular comment on that. On that, is is this moving us towards getting us closer to security, and will that have an impact in the way people do their assessments? Well, and, and you bring up a good point because it was kind of interesting. The the new standard spends almost a page and a half discussing uh, business as usual or BAU. And then we got to the community meeting, and Bob Russo stood before us and said, well, it's just a suggestion. And, you know, there was kind of a long, silent pause after that because we all thought that this was going to lead us to additional testing and, and really put some meat behind the standard. And it turns out that, they're just trying to to get people to understand that BAU is what makes a security program work, but we're not going to hold anybody accountable to that. And we all in the QSA community are kind of frustrated, but this is their approach. So that, that brings a really good question, and um, what I would like to do now is actually post that question to the audience that is um, right now in, in viewing this presentation. But do you believe that your organization's culture lends itself to implementing business as usual? You know, the responses are definitely, uh, maybe, and probably not. If you could take a few um, moments and uh, help us respond to that question, it will um, it will be interesting to see what the result um, comes. What what would be your um, uh, your what, what do you estimate that people will answer here, Jeff? Do you get a, a sense of people will will see this as um, you know, do they have the culture in place in their organization to be able to do the business as usual? I'm guessing B maybe is going to be probably our leader, but it's hard telling. I, I, I should have put just uh, definitely and in, in not. <laughs> Most people, when they get a choice of the gray, they will choose that. 
we'll give people a few more uh, seconds here to answer. We have about almost 100 votes in, and uh, those of you who haven't voted, uh, last chance to vote before we view some of those results. Let me close the voting, and uh, actually you were right, Jeff. 56% uh, of the people said maybe. 28% said definitely yes, and about 17% said probably not, uh, which is probably, you know, a good bell curve right there. Um, let me move on now, uh, interesting results. Let me move out now into some of the critical changes that you need to start planning for now as you prepare for the PCI DSS. So, you know, we talked about eight different considerations. One is begin working on data flow diagram, documenting your um, user access and business purposes, getting your arms around sensitive authentication data, your POS devices, your inventory of your wireless points, in scope devices is huge, uh, credentials for your service providers, and pen testing, which I've heard a lot of discussion about this. Um, Jeff, will you give us just a brief overview of your take on that? Maybe I'll, I'll pose an additional question here. Um, and this one should, should be pretty simple for people. Um, have you started your PCI 3.0 planning efforts already? Um, yes, not, or 2015, it's a long time away. Um, well, Jeff just discusses those eight considerations in in brief, um, maybe you can uh, help us vote on this question as well. And I'll I'll start at the bottom. The pen testing methodology has probably gotten the most the most discussion because, it, like the OWASP top ten, they quoted a particular standard, even though there are other standards available, and they don't necessarily hold you to that, but uh, the, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology standard is probably going to be the one that most people are going to, to implement just because the SSC seemed to endorse it when there are plenty of other available methodologies that would also satisfy the, the requirement. Service provider credentials going to be an issue there. Uh, if you're a merchant and you have service providers that are in your network maintaining things, supporting things, um, you're, gonna, you're going to see a change there, possibly have outages as a result of that. Um, inventory of in-scope devices, another one that's going to be one that's going to be difficult. And we have a lot of people voting this time, I see. Yeah, maybe I should just uh, stop uh, the audience voting view at some of those um, results. And it seems like 36% of the people um, have already started. Um, and with 57%, uh, well, actually, I'll summarize that to 64%. Um, not yet. So what, um, you know, let's look at the first one, uh, Jeff, as we started looking at begin working on data flow diagrams. This will probably be the biggest challenge uh, that the organizations will face in version 3. And um, why, why do you say that? And why do you think that, there, that people need to address this uh, particular requirement immediately? Well, the, the reason the council is pushing this so hard is merchants, service providers, whomever's trying to meet the standard, most of them just can't scope them right. And a lot of that comes down to the fact that even with the open PCI scoping toolkit, there's still arguments about which systems are connected to what, and a lot of that goes to the fact that no one actually can tell us 
how data gets from a cash register to the acquiring bank, where that connection occurs. Yes, they know where it goes out of their network. Yes, they know where it starts out from, but they have no idea of that intermediate step unless it's a very, very simple network. And I don't know of too many organizations these days that have that kind of a simple network. So as a result, when you start talking to the network people, they're sitting there saying, well, you know, we, we just code in paths and routes and data flows. And then you talk to the security people, and they're talking about ports, and they open ports and at these firewalls, and data flows. And then you start talking to developers, and developers, when you ask them, you know, what ports do your applications use, in a lot of cases, they just stare at you like, what are you asking me? And so as a result, there's, there's nobody who knows how something gets from one point in the network to the other. So to address this, the SSC, the council, finally said this has got to stop. And so now they're asking that the data flow diagram be overlaid on top of the network diagram. It's an actual requirement. You, you can't pass the, the assessment anymore unless you do that. Well, if we've got people who don't understand and can't tell us how that happens, for some organizations, this becomes just a nightmare um, because of the complexity of the network, the complexity of their applications, um, how security is rolled out, I mean, add in e-commerce. And it can, it can become very, very difficult. Now. There are some automated tools that can show how something flows from one point in the network to another. And I'm betting like we had a couple of years ago when, when Seam was all the rage and everybody was buying Seam systems and solutions uh, in order to meet the logging requirements in Section 10, I think we're going to see the same thing occur here in order to meet this requirement. interesting uh, take on that. Um, uh, you know, I think with all of the technology, it should be, should be looked as to why are you putting that control in place and what is your end goal before you start uh, um, buying technology. And this comes uh, as a surprise to many of you from a, hearing it from a technology vendor. <laughs> um, should we move into slide, um, slide uh, you know, the number two consideration, uh, Jeff? Great. So this one actually had a lot of discussion at the community uh, meeting, and, um, and and for some good reason. And I'll I'll get you to mention, do your caller commentary here as well in a minute, Jeff. But um, at Tripwire, we also did um, a risk-based security management study in conjunction with the Poneman Institute, and we found that in the retail sector, 34% of the the people in order to reduce risk management, they do measure the reduction in access and authentication violations as part of that. So um, I interesting fact that both the, re the results of our study that were unrelated to the PCI DSS, but heavy retail focus, mentioned that as a factor to reduce risk. So give us your take on how do you document uses, access, and, and business purpose for the version three of the standard. Well, we were, to a degree, already doing this uh, in version two, but what the council wants now is, is not only a list of users for the PCI environment, but they want to know what the purpose of each role is. Well, for a lot of organizations, there are a lot of roles, and the problem becomes that those roles have always been kind of loosey-goosey, not necessarily tightly defined. Um, you'd have system administrators, network administrators, very, very clear. 
it's the user end of the equation where things weren't necessarily always so tight. And as a result, it was kind of nebulous, you know. And and so what they're, what they're asking for is, is for everybody who has a role with access to the cardholder data environment to have that role defined. The problem, of course, is there's no grace period for this. So you're going to have to produce that documentation day one for version three. You don't get to wait until um, July of 2015 to get that produced. And so that's going to be a struggle for some organizations because there's a definition that's going to have to be written, and there are a lot of people with a lot of roles that have access. Interesting that there's no um, grace grace period on, on that one. So the number three is take inventory of wireless access points. And some of these you would think, well, duh, that makes sense. But here's another requirement that needs to be implemented as soon as possible in order for us to move to version three. And what would you say is the rationale behind this requirement, Jeff? Well, again, it's people weren't maintaining a good list of wireless access points. As a result, when they go through 11.1 to do their inventory and say, these are accepted access points, these are rogue access points, because there wasn't a complete inventory, how did you make that reconciliation and make that determination? So as a result, you know, it was kind of a haphazard type type kind of thing, and then add in the fact that you've got now people floating around, particularly in the merchant environment, with physical retail, they have smartphones, tablets, et cetera, that can act as a wireless access point. They're in their pocket. They're in their purse. Um, and so there was, there, there was no good control here. Now, where most of the discussion occurs with this is you can't mark 11.1, any of 11.1, not applicable. It has to be discussed by the QSA. And so anyone thinking that, oh, we'll just, you know, wireless is out of scope, uh, no, it's not. Your QSA still has to go through and document everything in 11.1 you're still required to do an inventory, whether you have wireless or not, whether it's in scope or not. And so you're going to have to deal it, deal with it. Now, the good news is a lot of large organizations have gone and implemented tools such as Air Magnet, Air Defense, Air Wave, Air whatever. Um, and so they're going to be able to probably produce inventories fairly easily. Um, they just need to run a report, give it to the QSA, show that it's being reconciled and be done. If you haven't invented, invested in a tool, um, you're going to be in, in a pretty bad spot, particularly if you have a lot of wireless running around. So again, with, with, um, with the network mapping tools, I'm guessing that we're going to see sales increases in wireless management tools as well. So one of the things that I've um, failed to mention at the beginning is that when um, we started looking at these eight considerations, there's a lot of, um, of um, perspective that the council still needs to provide um, in terms of, you know, specifics on the reporting and, and how the QSAs are going to measure this. However, these eight considerations are factual uh, things, factual requirements that your organization needs to do right now. There's no bias on opinion here. They're, they're factual things that you're going to have to do uh, regardless of whether the council provides a little bit more guidance or more requirements around them. So with that being said, let's move on number four, which is how to maintain an inventory of in-scope devices. Now, this 
similarly to the wireless access point, um, it's another inventory item that will need to be addressed immediately, Jeff, and that could cause similar nightmares to the previous requirement. Uh, why would you say that, and, and why did you put this as number four in um, on our list? Well, the the primary reason is is you really can't do number four until you complete number one. Um, for those of you that have gotten a copy of the Open PCI Scoping Toolkit, um, you understand the concept that there are various shades of connected systems. And some connected systems have more risk to them than others. Um, but in order to determine what's connected and what isn't, um, you really need to know how that data flows over your network. And what I think is going to happen is a lot of organizations are going to go through, map everything out, and find out to their shock and possible horror that sections of their network that they thought were uninvolved, isolated away, didn't have an effect on the cardholder data environment, are in fact in scope in some form or another. And so as a result, I think we're going to see, unfortunately, a significant increase in those Category 2 systems that were, that were believed to be out of scope. But now, because we've mapped the data flow over the network, we now understand that it's, those systems are in scope. And then, just to add insult to injury in this whole process is the concept of virtualization. Whether you're talking servers, storage, desktops, uh, whatever, and that creates an entirely new problem because which desktops have access to which networks and how does our virtual environment impact those things. Most organizations have great, great control and great understanding of their physicality of networks and servers and, want, and that serve up virtualization, but don't always have the best understanding of virtualization itself and how that impacts things. And I think we're also going to see some some issues there too, and some education in in that area. Great, interesting, interesting take on that. Um, let's look at number five, which is getting your arms around sensitive authentication data. Um, in you know that the the term uh, sensitive authentication data or uh, SAD is replacing that um, cardholder data as the term du jour in the DSS. And uh, although it has always been in the glossary, it has never been widely used before until now. So give us give us your perspective on this and, and why this requirement uh, makes it to the top eight. Well, this is kind of a good news, bad news uh, situation, actually. The good news is, is the reason this requirement now exists is, is all you folks out there did a good job securing your systems. Um, the bad news is, is because you did that, um, attackers have changed their tactics. And so the, the attacks now are going after um, SAD in memory. So we've seen the advent of Black Paws, vSkimmer, a variety of malware, uh, including doctored terminals and whatnot. Um, and the attack has moved from the usual brute force stuff that we were dealing with when the DSS first came about to now sophisticated attacks where people are actually creating software to go and find the SAD while it exists in memory before it's encrypted by DLLs and, and everything else. So the council in response to that came up with this new requirement, 656. And the unfortunate thing is, is 
a lot of QSAs, myself included, at the council at the community meeting said, isn't it a little late in the game to be asking this question when we're out in the field? And it came back and it said, yes, um, probably is, but we want you to ask it anyway because in those instances where people are coding their own solutions, we need to know that programmers understand that this is the new threat vector and they need to protect SAD while it's in it's in memory. And so here we are. Um, for most of you out there that are buying package solutions, this will fall on your your package solution provider and their PADSF certification. Okay, that's great. Um, so, Jeff, we do have already about 10 questions uh, piling up here, which is great interaction, and um, I, I will make sure that we'll, we'll have enough time to address them um, at the end. Uh, one question that I, uh, or I guess one request that I would like to bring in is if you haven't rated this webcast and would like to do so, that would be really helpful for us. So let's move to, to number six and protect your point of sale terminals. And, um, and this is one that's probably going to take uh, organizations a long while to roll out, and one that doesn't take into effect until July 1st of 2015. However, July is just around the corner, so what is your take on this one, Jeff? Well, for most large retailers, this, will, uh, this is going to take a while of planning, um, rolling out procedures, training employees, and that's why it's important that uh, merchants understand what, what's going on here. Again, it's a good news, bad news thing. The good news is we've done a good job. We've, we've secured things. The bad news is the bad guys have found new ways to come at us, and this uh, requirement, 9-9, is meant to address those new attack vectors, key of which is people are now doctoring terminals to the point where your own employees, let alone your, your customers, don't necessarily know that the terminal has been doctored. And this is particularly true if the software has been doctored. Um, just last week there was uh, Brian Krebs had out a uh, post on a new keyboard that's being manufactured that fits over the top of certain point-of-sale terminals, and unless you're really eagle-eyed when you look at it, you won't know that it's occurred. So that's what this is addressing, is the security of the terminal itself, because as we move forward, as people head to point-to-point -point encryption, the terminal will become the attack vector. That is going to be the point of attack, and the next point of attack will be wherever that decryption occurs. So here we are. Um, you're going to need to protect that, and that's going to involve a locked cradle, um, security tape on the seams to make sure that someone's not popping them open, um, logging, of data coming from your terminal to make sure that it's not communicating with something you don't want it to communicate with, uh, video monitoring of terminals at all hours. The reason that's important is a lot of these terminal swap outs are occurring off hours by stocking crews, cleaning crews, people that you may not even employ. They might be a third-party service. Um, replacing card equipment, making sure that people out in the field, if they receive a box that says, hey, replace your terminal with this terminal, they call and confirm that with a help desk before that actually happens. Um, all of these are in response to um, Schmucks, um, Barnes & Noble, um, because all these breaches were a form of the terminal being affected out in the field. So this is where we're at. You're going to have to step up your game. The council realizes that will take time, and they're giving you that time. 
in that stat that it's to the right, it's really interesting that uh, almost half of those um, breaches annually happen at the point of sale. So um, a lot of um, a lot of opportunity for risk here as well. So um, number seven, uh, work through service provider uh, provider credentials, and um, you know a lot of people have called this a troublemaker. And um, why would you consider that being such bad news for the industry, Jeff? And how do people get started now? Um, even though the the good news is that they have until July of 2015 to be compliant. Well, I, I, this only affects service providers. Um, it'll indirectly affect the merchants who are the service providers' customers. Um, what the council, actually what, what the forensic examinations after breaches of service providers and, or rather merchants found was the breach was occurring through the remote access credentials of the service providers. And the reason it was occurring was is the service provider was using the same user identifier or user identifiers and passwords with every customer they had. So as a result, any merchant that was running software solution XYZ or the service provider was managing and maintaining their firewalls, if that if those credentials became known, the attackers just then had to figure out who was who was working with a particular service provider or was using a particular service provider solution and they could log in. Um, so as a result, to stop that, we're now given requirement 851, which requires service providers to use different credentials with every one of their customers. Now on the face of that, that shouldn't be too huge a problem. There have been, there's IAM, Identity Access Management, that's available. There are uh, password vaults, credential wallets, those kinds of solutions that are available on an enterprise level. And so the solution is available. However, my experience in organizations that have rolled those solutions out has found that uh, service providers run into issues as they roll that out. Credentials aren't always updated in a timely manner when they get changed. Um, and so then all of a sudden SLAs, uh, service level agreements, start to become impacted. Um, in some cases a merchant may even have an outage because the vendor can't get in because the credentials that are in the wallet weren't right. Um, and that occurs because employees get used to the fact that you go to the wallet, you get the credentials, you log in, and so I don't have to remember anything anymore. And you run into service problems because the credentials in the wallet weren't correct, and then you have to track down the person that that has the correct credentials. Um, in addition to this one, the requirement 1282 is going to require that service providers also acknowledge their responsibility to protect um, SAD for all those organizations that um, they provide services to. So that, that will also be an impact as well. So the last one of um of those considerations is probably one that has caused the most controversy in the industry, and this is uh, the notion of implementing a, a pen testing methodology. And um, I remember, you know, three, four years ago when a similar requirement was made around the, the QSA and, uh, you know, selecting or creating a more consistent methodology for QSA. So, um, Give us your take here, Jeff, on why this is so controversial and, um, you know, why it has taken so long. Well, that's a good question, why it's taken so long, because um, it shouldn't have, but it has. Um, you know, pen testing's one, 
pen testing is one of the most contentious subjects in network security. And a lot of it has to do with there, there are a, a lot of ways that you can do a penetration test. And unfortunately, a lot of security professionals aren't always understanding of the differentiation between a vulnerability scan and a pen test. And it's gotten even more confusing as the vulnerability scanning people have enhanced their tool sets to not only scan from the outside, but do credentialed scans from the inside. And it, it giving the appearance of a penetration test, but not necessarily resulting in a full penetration test. So as a result, the council came back for version three and said, we're going to address this. And the first thing that raised everybody's hackles was the fact that they only gave one example of a standard, and that was the NIST SP800-115. And of course, everyone said, well, what's wrong with the open pen testing uh, methodology? What's wrong? And they started rattling off the three or four others that are out there in the world. And the council came back and said, there's nothing. That's what the wording at the other end of that standard says, which is, and similar. And that didn't really placate people, but it's, it's like the OWASP top 10 all over again, where people argued about that forever. Um, at the end of the day, if you can Google a good pen testing methodology, and there are three or four of them out there, some are open source, some are proprietary, but they're there. You can use those, and they should be acceptable to any QSA. Um, so pick a methodology, prove that you implement it, and you should be good to go. Now, the next thing that raised a stink is the fact that the pen testing methodology now has to prove that your network segmentation is in fact in place. And no longer is an organization going to be allowed to say, here's our configs, here's our VLAN, see, it all works. Um, not only is the pen testing methodology going to prove this out, but if you're going to buy one of those tools to help you with your data flow diagram, that will also probably give you proof that your network segmentation actually works as well. Because most of those simulation tools will tell you that a port can fork off the network path. And so not only can you prove it with the pen testing methodology, you can prove that with the tool. But the final kicker that really got everybody going was the fact that the pen test must cover threats that the organization has encountered during the last 12 months. And this isn't just network threats. These are malware attacks, antivirus outbreaks, anything that put a threat to the network. And so as a result, we're actually finally putting, getting, the council's finally putting meat to what was 6.2 in version, version 2.0, but is now 6.1. So you're actually going to have to prove now that your vulnerability management program is not only in place, but that it's working as well. So the bottom line is, is that you're going to actually have to prove everything out to make sure that your vulnerability management system's working, you're following a pen testing methodology that's an industry accepted methodology, and your network segmentation does, in fact, protect the cardholder data environment from the rest of your network. Okay, so there are three uh, things to focus your attention on, and, um, you know, you can read them here on the screen, and for the um, benefit of time, what I would like to do is ask the audience as well, and this is, would be the last polling question before we get into the Q&A, which of the top three things do you feel are most important to being ready for PCI DSS 3.0? Um, 
um, A, protect your point of uh, sales terminals, B, work through the service provider credentials, C, implement a pen testing methodology, and uh, the last one, none of the above. We'll get people um, a few uh, more seconds here to vote. And uh, in the meantime, I will also ask you to uh, please rate the presentation if you haven't already. And um, I'm guessing it's not the C's voting. Yeah. I'm guessing C is going to be our leader. Okay, well, let me stop it and view our results to see if uh, you were correct. Uh, yeah, that one got almost 50% of the votes. The POS. POS terminals 28 and the uh, service provider credentials 16% uh, and 8% of the none of the above. So let me, um, while I leave you with this key PCI resources in the background, I would like to move into some of the questions. And uh, Jeff, um, we have uh, close to, I think, 20 of them. So I'm sure we're not going to get to those. But what I'm going to ask is if we can uh, be as succinct as we can on the answers so that we can get as many um, of these possible. Um, the first one should be fairly simple is um, how long, when we talk about BAU, business as usual, how long do you expect um, that the council will be working on, on getting that in, in terms of organizational culture as well? Because um, people here say it's been nearly five years in getting that integration along. Yeah, it. Uh, you know, I'm. Some of us of late have started to wonder if the council is is laying a foundation uh, for implementing BAU throughout the standard, and they put it in there as a way to gauge reaction from everyone that's covered by the DSS. Um, because in order to in order to prove it and integrate it into the DSS, that's going to require that the QSAs test um, everything across the reporting period, which obviously is going to make things. It's go, that takes time, um, and time is money when a QSA is doing that work. Um, I think that's where they might be headed. Um, whether or not uh, that is where they're headed, at the end of the day, any good security professional knows that security has to be embedded in their organization. So in order to be successful, BAU has to be there in some form. Uh, whether or not we ever test for it, I don't know, but um, it has to be there. If it's not there, um, you're not going to have good security. So it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. Yeah, and in, in terms of discussion always as to whether, you know, you should do it regardless as to whether it's mandated or not. Um, let's move to a different question here. How do you think cloud-based systems will be impacted with 851? And maybe we can uh, summarize what 851 is. I don't have the standard with me here shortly, but you probably know it by heart, uh, Jeff. <laughs> no, 851 is the, uh, is the service provider um, issue, if I remember correctly. Let me just make sure that that is the case, but... I do believe that was it, yeah. Um, this is a problem that uh, Amazon ran into. Um, the Amazon Cloud was deemed PCI compliant only to find out that it wasn't. Uh, at least it wasn't assessed in the way it should have been assessed. Um, the council came out with the cloud guidance and said, obviously, Virtualization's in scope. It has to be because even though you try and isolate it, it's not really isolated. And all that Amazon was assessed on was policy standards and procedures and physical access to their data centers. Um, 851, technically, if the cloud provider doesn't have access to your cloud, um, it'll have zero impact other than 
they'll be managing their environment, you'll be managing your environment. It's when they have access to your environment that now 851 comes into play. So if you're running um, a point-of-sale solution that happens to run in the cloud and your vendor manages it, that will mean that they need their own credentials in order to get into your environment, no different than if you were hosting it internally. Um, if they're just providing a virtualized environment and you're carving that up in your own environment and they have no access, then they're going to be covered by the cloud standard as laid out in the, in the information guidance that was provided last year. Great, thank you for answering that. Um, Jeff, in the similar similar but different veins, um, you know, this question is, you know, how do we strongly encourage our vendors to take PCI DSS 3.0 seriously when the PA DSS applies to them specifically? You know, one of the vendors doesn't provide good documentation, um, but they want to, so there's again, you know, that that compliance requirement versus strong security and how do you get your vendors that, um, you know, to take it seriously enough. Right, and, and in conjunction with the DSS 3.0, um, the PA DSS 3.0 is also being rolled out. There were a lot of changes in the PA DSS. Probably one of the biggest changes is the PA DSS certification can no longer be granted if the user guide is not provided and is deemed not sufficient. Um, so the, not only will the PA QSA be reviewing that documentation, but the council will as well, and certification is not going to be granted if it doesn't meet the standards that the council is setting forth in the new version of the PA DSS. Now where the struggle is going to be is, is supposedly the PA QSAs are going to be required to ensure that ports and the proper documentation for implementation is provided. Whether or not that happens, I, I don't know because just as PCI QSAs those of us that assess to the DSS get yelled at for not being consistent. The PA QSAs also get shaken down for the fact that, that we're, we're also not very consistent. As a result, it's going to depend on who that PA QSA is, how diligent they are, how strict they are, and whether or not that information gets in. I can tell you it's supposed to be there, but until we actually see that standard implemented, I, I can't tell you if we're going to get better or not. Uh, hopefully we will, because I have to rely on it when I'm assessing merchants. So we'll see. Well, I'll take a couple of more questions before we run out of time, and I apologize ahead of time for all of you who I'm not going to be able to get to. Um, the next question is, if wireless is out of scope, so for example, if a company does not have any wireless access points, to what extent does 1111 have to be documented? Um, it does have to be documented. Um, just because wireless is out of scope, um, does not relieve any organization of complying with 11, anything in 11.1. Um, and that's because even though it's out of scope, um, you're still going to have to prove that, and that'll be part of your pen testing methodology, is to prove that your wireless can't get to the cardholder data environment and vice versa. Um, so all that's going to have to be documented. You're going to have to make sure that a rogue wireless access point couldn't be put inside your cardholder data environment or couldn't end up as a connected network segment somewhere um, because those are that's where the breaches are occurring. 
And I can tell you from customer experience when I've conducted wireless testing, um, people that are relying on the, the air defense, air magnet stuff, until you really test that in your environment and see what it would look like if an attacker was truly coming in, you don't know what you'll see. Um, those, those products are set up for the person that goes out to Best Buy, buys the Linksys, Belkin, whatever, wireless AP, comes back to work and plugs it in without any modification. I can tell you attackers don't do that. They come in, it's loaded with DDWRT, it's set up to look like it has a MAC address on the wired side that looks like your Dell, HP, whatever desktop notebook you're running is a MAC address, and then it's not broadcasting the SID, it's set on the edge of your network um, so that your air defense doesn't necessarily see it on a regular basis. Um, they're very, very tricky and sophisticated about it. And until you take that approach, you won't know what you're going to see. And that is why 11.1 is still important. Great. Thank you so much. Um, before I take the next question, I'm, I'm just going to do a shameless plug here. But tomorrow we do have another webcast at Tripwire called Vulnerability Voodoo and the Convergence of Foundational Security Controls. And for that one, we have um, Charles Collegy, who is an analyst at the IDC uh, firm, research firm, joining us for that webcast. So I'll leave this up for a minute here while we take the last questions. We're, you're going to laugh I'd, at this, Jeff. But I'd, I'd like to talk about the tokenization question, if I could. Okay, great. Um, the question is, okay. will tokenization still be able to significantly reduce PCI scope? And the reason I want to bring this up is, is tokenization is an after-the-fact exercise. Um, it has people forget about PCI is about process storing and transmittal of SAD. We focus a lot on storage at the neglect of processing and, and transmittal. Tokenization is a back-end exercise. Um, it has nothing to do with the transmittal of the SAD from the terminal out to the processor. And so while it shrinks the scope because you're not storing stuff, you still have the network. And so this is why point-to-point -point encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, whatever you want to call it, that's why that's getting so much uh, so much discussion at the moment because that'll take the the network out of scope because now you're encrypting the data flow back and forth but people have to remember even with point to point encryption that terminal or point of sale device is still susceptible to attack so you still have the threat of vpod or black pods v skimmer and those kinds of things that are going to try and get that data before it gets encrypted. Great. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, I just noticed here this is Tuesday, December 16th, but it's actually tomorrow, Tuesday, December 17th, um, the webcast here. I'll leave you also with our contact information in case we don't get to your questions and you would like to reach out to us. I would like to appreciate the time and your interaction in this session. And Jeff, particularly to you, thank you very much. I appreciate all your input and your, your feedback. You're truly the PCI guru. So thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you. It's always a pleasure to get an opportunity to talk on this topic. Thank you, and that concludes our presentation today.